the question you asked really go takes us back almost to the founding of the group and you know um, the group was founded by my great grandfather's older brother whose name was Adesha and further built um, by by my great grandfather after whom I'm actually named um, but you know I think the purpose of the group when it was started in 1897 uh, was to be a part of India's freedom movement um, and what my what Adesha at that time had identified as a critical issue for the country was the need to create economic uh, engine that was self-sufficient that could help the country um, you know create an environment where the economy could flourish without British involvement and the the purpose of the group was was always to be something a little bit more than just business results and business profits um, you know I think most of the profits at that time were contributed to the freedom movement and I think that legacy um, has really kind of flowed into uh, and, and through the group throughout the years across all our businesses. I think the, the idea that, that by trying to do what is best for society overall, trying to do our best to contribute to the growth, uh, not just of our own businesses, but to, uh, to the broader environment, is the best way to help our, our, ourselves succeed. And I think, and there's no silver bullet that helps us, you know, get this uh, kind of culture inculcated uh, across the group, but I think it's a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that I think helps a lot is in kind of attracting the kind of people who uh, who have a similar philosophy and who believe that kind of strong governance um, and seeking to really improve uh, things for the wider society will uh, is something that they're passionate about personally and will ultimately lead to business results. So I think you know the the group, the promoters have always held. Um, that belief that kind of doing right uh, is more important, thinking about the longer term is more important, and that if you do that consistently, uh, the business results uh, will, will certainly flow as a result. Frankly, I don't think the company scale having reached current levels despite market conditions over the last five or ten years being quite challenging would necessarily have been possible without the brand. And particularly in a sector like real estate, which, as all of you know, um, is typically known for a lot of governance issues where customers have typically had a hard time um, getting you know, deliveries on time, getting the right quality. I think the power of the Godrej brand helps immensely because it, you know, when we do surveys about what the brand stands for in customers' mind, almost always the first thing we hear is trust. Um, and I think particularly in a sector like real estate where that is in great short supply and when people are making what's often the largest investments of their lives, something that's critically needed, I think that's a huge advantage. Um, but I would also say that that's not a sufficient condition. That's a very important uh, aspect of what's helped us scale the business. But I think, you know, we identified a while ago that this was a business that we saw a lot of opportunity in and I think have been quite committed as a promoter group uh, to see this business, even when it was very small and the sector was kind of plagued with issues, as one that in a decade or two could look very different and one where the industry itself could look very different. Right. So I think that focus um, has helped us greatly because there are a lot of conglomerates with equally strong brands who've entered the, the sector with, with, with somewhat less success. So I think that, that focus on kind of the big opportunity combined with the advantage of the brand and you know, a, a slightly aggressive growth strategy uh, has, has really helped scale the business. Diversity of thought in any business or any enterprise really is a, is a very critical thing to inculcate. Um, and whether it's diversity in terms of uh, the great experience some of the professionals who've been with the group uh, for 40 years have uh, versus the uh, you know, youth and excitement some of the younger uh, members of our team have, or whether it's things like gender diversity, I think one of the very core philosophies of the group is to be very inclusive, is to welcome people from all backgrounds, to make sure that the teams we're creating have that balance. Um, we've, for example, laid great emphasis on you know, being at the forefront uh, in, of Indian employers in including LGBT talent within the group. Um, gender diversity has for many years been a, a critical priority. And you know, I think it is through that flow and exchange of different ideas, different viewpoints, different backgrounds that the, that the company can best succeed. And I think as a promoter group, our view is that, you know, the, what the, probably the most sing, single most critical ingredient of our group and frankly any group success is the quality of people we are able to attract to the group. And then after that, how well we can uh, do in making sure they feel 
uh, empowered and motivated to give their best uh, to the group every day. So I think we've accepted and is sort of part of our DNA now that that is one of the most critical priorities for the leadership team at Godridge to make sure that we're cons consistently paying attention to this. Yeah. And certainly, I think one of the key ways to make sure, making sure everyone feels uh, uh, empowered and motivated is having an inclusive team with, with a wide variety of perspectives. Yeah, you know, I think probably the most important lesson that uh, you know, proceed, the preceding generation has taught all of us uh, in the group is the importance of um, kind of adding value uh, from a long-term perspective and looking at it as more than just short-term business results. Um, doing business the right way, adding uh, and, you know, developing all the stakeholders of uh, the business. Um, and that's a pretty fundamental principle that I think, you know, is taken as a given in the group. So I think if there are any, um, any areas where there is a conflict between governance and business results, it's not much of a conflict typically. Uh, because I think that there is, uh, you know, that clear emphasis. And I think the, uh, you know, my father, the others in his generation have done a tremendous job in ensuring that everyone entering the group, whether they be part of the promoter family or, um, you know, professional employees, um, really understands that that is what is expected. That is kind of the, the bedrock and foundation of the group. It both makes sense because it's the right thing to do and kind of is what we believe yeah from a values perspective, but we're equally convinced that it makes financial sense. Yeah. Um, you know, even if you look at it as, uh, from a purely business angle, because if you look at the kind of advantage we have today and the kind of standing we have today as a group, a very large part of that comes from our reputation, from our brand. And I think, you know, the, the group is 121 years, uh, it was founded 121 years ago. It's certainly constantly evolving. I think we'll have to keep evolving. Um, I think the, the, the basis and bedrock is this focus on governance, focus on, on quality and you know, developing all the stakeholders that are involved with the business. But I think certainly there are changes in terms of how we are approaching businesses. I think there are also you know, other, other changes. I think in our generation, for example, design is something that is a, is a pretty important priority to all of us. So product innovation and design, I think, is something that is getting a renewed focus at, at, at the group. Um, but yeah, I think this combination of you know what's best about our heritage and legacy, and making sure that we're able to uh, build on that legacy by constantly uh, getting better at what we do, is really the the key opportunity. Okay. Uh, but I think it would be a, a little optimistic to think that you know that our, that our, our CEO career the company trajectories in years. <laughs> had, had nothing to do with our last names. So you know, I think. Um, we, we, we were able to have, uh, you know, expedited leadership uh, uh, opportunities. But yes, I think it is very fundamentally important uh, to understand the businesses um, we're leading. And I think the structure we've had that is a little bit different is that we're not necessarily looking in our generation to have a single individual chair all the major businesses, yeah. for example. If there are, we're, we're looking at really who in our generation is best suited uh, for each company's role, and a big part of that is obviously how well you understand the company. Yeah. But certainly a combination of um, giving people that room and account, you know, holding them accountable, but giving them the room to operate in a free manner and not constantly looking over their shoulder. Um, so I think that that combination of kind of freedom and accountability is one important part. And really pushing people to um, develop their own self-awareness as a first stage, I think, is very important. So at the group, and I think the expectation is, is obviously that, that people look to constantly improve themselves. Nobody is perfect. There are always uh, areas where one can improve. improve. Uh, but I think the first thing that, that we look to inculcate is a sense of self-awareness, make people aware of where their blind spots are, what are areas where they have room for improvement, Equally importantly, what are the strengths that they have that they bring to the table that they should fully leverage uh, for their own individual careers as well as for, for businesses' uh, success? So I think that that process of constantly having a learning mindset uh, is something that's important. Uh, you know, my father is, is remarkable in that he's constantly uh, looking at opportunities, even at you know, his, the stage of career he's reached, uh, introspecting, understanding oneself, um, holding people accountable, but giving them uh, the freedom and opportunity to, to learn from their own mistakes.
innovation is, of course, tremendously important for any business. I think unless you're thinking of new ways uh, to disrupt yourself, someone else will and, and uh, will you know, take a lead from doing that. So I think it's something that we've looked at more, frankly, at the company level, because I think, um, I, I think the group's responsibility is to make sure we're creating an enabling framework, but we actually don't believe in, in trying to set up too many things in a corporate center mm -hmm. uh, as a way of doing things. We, we don't think that's the best way uh, to really achieve business success because our business units are quite different. You know, a property business has uh, some things in common, but not that much with an FMCG business. Same could be said of our agri business, our retail business, we have, you know, private equity business, appliances business. These businesses don't have that much to do with each other. So I think understanding the business context and what innovation means in that context uh, is critically important. And, you know, different businesses have approached it in, in, in different ways. Um, and it's an area of tremendous uh, importance to the group, to the, you know, my sister, Nisa, is the chairperson of Godrich Consumer Products. And R&D is actually one of the few functions that reports directly to her, again, signifying um, the level of importance she attaches to that. Um, you know, in a business like Godrich Properties, which, which, uh, uh, which I had been leading, we don't see R&D in its true sense as being as relevant, but certainly we think innovation is very important. So I think one of the areas we identified as being a critical weakness uh, for real estate players was the inability to generate adequate returns on capital. It tends to be a very capital-intensive industry, highly regulated, which leads to you know, uh, significant delays and so on. And one of the things that, that leads to this kind of uh, low returns on capital is that a lot of uh, capital gets locked in in yeah. land acquisition right up front. Um, so one of the key areas where Godrich Properties has innovated repeatedly is in finding different business models that, that allow us to scale the company quickly without locking in too much capital. I think all of those are innovations of a different kind and I think have played a massive role um, you know, in the company being able to scale as quickly as it has. So I think the, 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 the reason that innovation is important is pretty self-evident. I mentioned a couple of, couple of recent examples. Uh, but throughout the group's history, there have been uh, you know, very important in it, innovations that have allowed us to enter new businesses. We started as a locks business. We've since uh, you know, gone into many different things with a fair degree of success. And I think that mindset of innovation and, and constantly pushing ourselves um, to think of new ways of doing things has been, a, has been an important contributor. Yeah. As a group, frankly, we're at, 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 if I'm being totally honest, at quite initial stages on this. We're not in industries that are uh, heavily disrupted by, uh, by the digital transformation. So I think um, we're making initial steps. Obviously, things like digital marketing has become a very core part of uh, our overall marketing strategy. I think we're just starting to grapple with things like big data and what should the approach be. And again, it's something that we're, we're, we're looking at at the business level. But also there uh, is an example where at the group level do we need to think about things a bit, uh, a bit differently uh, on this. And I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything, anything great to report on what we've achieved on this uh, yet. You know, I think M&A, as, as, as we just heard, is something that, that can add huge value for, for businesses, but it can also, if done incorrectly, uh, you know, damage businesses quite significantly. Um, so I think our, our approach is that, that we're certainly looking at acquisitions, and I think it, again, is more relevant in some businesses than, than others. For example, in our property business, while we are constantly acquiring new properties, and that's sort of the, the, the fundamental basis for our, for our growth, um, there is less of an incentive to acquire full companies and more of a challenge in some ways uh, uh, to do that in, in a sector like real estate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in our FMCG business, uh, we've seen huge growth uh, come as a result of acquisitions. Um, so in the last 10 years, from being an entirely uh, India-based uh, business, we've now gotten to the stage where our India revenues are only about 50% of our, of our total revenues. And that's been delivered almost entirely uh, through M&A. Uh, we've had you know, great success. Actually, our, our first major M&A in the group was uh, acquiring our partner's stake in a business we were running, uh, Sarah Lee's stake in, in, in our erstwhile uh, the partnership with them in consumer product space. 
And that has been a huge part of, uh, you know, and today makes up a huge part of the group's uh, market cap and certainly of Godrej Consumer Products market cap. So I think we had a very positive start with our M&A journey there. Um, and that was, you know, more, it was over 15 years ago now. Since then, we've, we've, as I said, focused a lot on international acquisitions. We very successfully entered the Indonesia market uh, with an acquisition that's created a huge amount of value there. Um, we've done about eight or ten different acquisitions uh, in GCPL in Africa. Um, and actually, one of the lesser-known fun facts about the group is that we're now uh, the world's leading uh, producer of hair care solutions for women of African origin. Uh, yeah. Again, entirely based uh, out of these acquisitions we've done there. And we think that's a very exciting uh, platform that, that has been created and will present a lot of opportunity for growth. Another business where I think acquisitions could play a, a, big, a big role for us is Godrej AgroVet, mm -hmm. uh, which is our agribusiness, uh, which has a space in many different verticals within the agri economy. And again, we've seen interesting agri uh, opportunities on the acquisition side here. Uh, we've done a couple in the last uh, two years. It's obviously early stages of kind of proving success in that. But certainly, I think given the scale of the space, given the um, number of interesting players, and importantly in that space also interesting valuations um, that, that we see. I think that that's certainly a business that, that will uh, we'll look at a lot of M&A. But I think, you know, as important as it is as a part of any group's uh, overall growth strategy, I think a very heavy dose of caution is uh, also uh, called for. Um, you know, as was mentioned, the global experience with m and is very mixed. Um, and overall, it, 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 it's clear that most M&As actually uh, don't end up uh, adding value and, and certainly aren't able to deliver the expected uh, results that, that uh, companies go in uh, with. So I think being as clear as we can on the strategic logic of the acquisition, uh, being conservative in the underwriting assumptions of the acquisition, um, and not getting carried away with, you know, with sort of deal fever and, and once, once things get into... Um, um, you know, discussions getting carried away on, on seeing the deal through are, I think, very important as well. So we're, we're certainly uh, open to and excited about acquisitions, but yeah. I think we, we must be very clear on, on the logic uh, for and always, uh, always be quite conservative in our approach as well. Well, you know, I think that the real estate uh, business is, is not for the faint-hearted, so I think we're, we're used to a, a, a fair amount of, uh, of change constantly happening. I think, um, you know, this year there happened to be all these big bang uh, changes all at once, but I think if you start looking at the kind of changes that affect a real estate project in different geographies, it doesn't feel like anything very new yeah. uh, in terms of the, the level of change. And I think one of the... One of the terrible things about working in the real estate sector is the kind of level of regulatory involvement and the kind of unnecessary uh, reduction in pace that happens as a result of that. But I think one of the wonderful things about working in the real estate sector is the, how dynamic it is, is the opportunity to you know, very significantly change the fortunes of a company through uh, good execution. The opportunity that presents to disproportionately perform is very significant and is something that we're focused on. Um, you know, we like to say at Godrej Properties that uh, it's a very exciting environment to be in because we think over the next 10, 20 years, there's every chance that India will be the fastest growing major economy yeah. uh, in the world. We think the real estate sector is a huge sector and there's every chance it will be uh, one of the fastest growing major sectors in the country. And that within that, we are as well placed as anyone else to kind of disproportionately benefit from that success. So that is a pretty exciting um, sort of paradigm to be in and, and try to make the most of. And some of the changes you mentioned um, having been introduced over the last uh, year and a half or so are actually quite beneficial for Godrej Properties and other established real estate developers over the medium term. I think over the short term, uh, they, they did have a little bit of a dampening effect on the market as a whole. But over the long term, I think what it's done is it's greatly improving the quality of governance that's going to be called for in the sector. Um, you know, the real estate sector today is way too fragmented. We have, I think, Creda, which is the real estate body, has something like 17,000 uh, developers that are members. Um, we, for the last three years, have been at least amongst the listed players, the leading developer in the country by value of real estate sold. We estimate our market share is not even 1%. Yeah. 
Um, so I think that speaks to a very high level of fragmentation and also speaks to you know, the, the 10,000th real estate developer is probably not going to be a great real estate developer. So I think there is a lot of consolidation in the industry that was already happening. Uh, but and certainly, that's your opportunity for m and Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think you know, we want to step on the gas now. We see the next couple of years as an ideal opportunity for a company like us because we're quite happy with our own sales. You know, our sales yeah. for the financial year have grown well in excess of 100%. Um, but the real opportunity is to use the current market where, where other developers or many developers are struggling to use that as an opportunity to partner them on their projects. But I do think that the reform of governance practices in the sector was very necessary. It has created a little bit of short-term dislocation. But I think for the longer term, both for industry participants as well as certainly for customers, uh, this was a very important step. Um, the group has been focused on environmental issues, actually, you know, even if, if, if for the last 40, 50 years, really, which is, you know, well before um, it, it became as prominent as an issue as it is today with more knowledge about climate change and pollution and its effects. Um, so I think that is something that's greatly inculcated into the group's uh, DNA, um, especially in our property business. It's, a, it's an area where we feel we can have a big impact. Uh, development, which is offices and residential homes, is a vast majority uh, in many cases of the total energy consumption that happens. And proper planning of these developments um, can lead to very, very dramatic improvements in the energy efficiency uh, of, of, of these structures. So I think that's something that we've been focused on for some time. In 2011, we committed that every single project we do would be a certified, third party certified. Uh, green development, and we've been sticking to that. Um, we, we were ranked the second best developer in Asia in terms of our sustainability. But equally through our businesses, through what we call our Good and Green program, uh, two key deliverables. One is this training of one million individuals. The other is that making sure that at least a third of our revenues are generated from what we call Good and Green products. Um, and they can either qualify for these good and green uh, uh, stature by being environmentally friendly. So, for mm -hmm. example, our real estate projects mm -hmm. that are certified as uh, green buildings. And for this criteria, we've actually set a higher level of certification yeah. than, than the basic one. But the other way that they can qualify is by being um, products that address needs at the bottom of the pyramid. So being products like Fastcard, which you mentioned, which is a one rupee uh, m mosquito repellent that uh, we think you know helps uh, obviously combat things like malaria and dengue in, in, in the country. The personal role in that has been more through the group and through our philanthropic trusts. Um, I, th I think the level of impact one can have there is much more. So we've you know, tried uh, as, a promote, as a promoter group, but as individuals as well, um, to make sure we're leading our businesses in, 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 in these areas as much as we are um, you know, in terms of business results. So I think the sustainability initiatives of Godrich Properties, uh, for example, are something that you know, I've been quite passionate about and personally uh, driving uh, since my time in the company. Um, and certainly we're involved with our philanthropic trusts and how they are uh, contributing monies. And, and I think the level of impact one feels that one can have through uh, you know, focusing resources of these large entities at these problems is, is honestly greater than... than, yeah. than uh, something individually, so that's, that's been kind of the primary focus. But, you know, I think um, it's, it's, it's pretty wonderful to be uh, in a position of as much opportunity uh, as one has, uh, to be part of a group um, that has both financial success as well as a, a strong track record, uh, you know, a very illustrious uh, legacy and a, and, and a tremendous brand. Um, so I think that, that, that both is a, is a wonderful opportunity and also, of course, uh, puts a fair amount of, uh, of accountability in some ways on one's shoulders. And I think um, it, would be, it, would be, it would be a, a great shame if, uh, you know, looking back on one's career, uh, one weren't able to fully take advantage of this opportunity and really make an impact in scaling the group uh, to the next level uh, and along the way continuing the great legacy the group has had um, in building you know, value, not only from a business context, but for all its stakeholders. So I think 
that's the primary focus. Um, you know, a lot of individual businesses where we'd like to see uh, dramatic changes uh, happen. Um, but I think overall, continuing the group as a group that uh, all of us can be very proud of what it stands for and continuing its, its overall success is, is, is sort of the most important uh, professional very deliverable. Interesting. The most important thing is really ultimately to enjoy what you're doing, feel passionate about what you're doing. I don't think uh, unless that is in place that you're going to be able to give your best. Um, so I think, you know, challenge yourself, uh, explore uh, new ideas. Uh, don't let things stagnate. Don't, don't, you know, just be in it only for the, uh, the financial rewards that come with it. And yeah, you know, I think we're, we're all quite lucky in a way to be uh, in India at this moment in time. Uh, I'm quite optimistic that uh, 30, 40 years from now, uh, these couple of decades will be looked at as, uh, as a point where India's uh, trajectory as a country really changed. And, you know, it's exciting for all of us to be able to be a part of it.